Section 34 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Fraser. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. Section 34. Selected Excerpts by Walter Badgett The Virtues of Stupidity From Letters on the French Coup d'Etat I fear you will laugh when I tell you what I conceive to be about the most essential mental quality for a free people whose liberty is to be progressive, permanent, and on a large scale. It is much stupidity. Not to begin by wounding any present susceptibilities, let me take the Roman character, for with one great exception, I need not say to whom I allude, they are the great political people of history. Now, is not a certain dullness their most visible characteristic? What is the history of their speculative mind? A blank. What their literature? A copy. They have left not a single discovery in any abstract science, not a single perfect or well-formed work of high imagination. The Greeks the perfection of human and accomplished genius, bequeathed to mankind the ideal forms of self-idolizing art. The Romans imitated and admired. The Greeks explained the laws of nature. The Romans wondered and despised. The Greeks invented a system of numerals second only to that now in use. The Romans counted to the end of their days with the clumsy apparatus which we still call by their name. The Greeks made a capital and scientific calendar. The Romans began their month when the Pontifex Maximus happened to spy out the new moon. Throughout Latin literature, this is the perpetual puzzle. Why are we free and they slaves? We praetors and they barbers. Why do the stupid people always win and the clever people always lose? I need not say that in real sound stupidity, the English are unrivalled. You'll hear more wit and better wit in an Irish street row than would keep Westminster Hall in humour for five weeks. In fact, what we opprobriously call stupidity, though not an enlivening quality in common society, is nature's favourite resource for preserving steadiness of conduct and consistency of opinion. It enforces concentration people who learn slowly learn only what they must. The best security for people's doing their duty is that they should not know anything else to do. The best security for fixedness of opinion is that people should be incapable of comprehending what is to be said on the other side. These valuable truths are no discoveries of mine. They are familiar enough to people whose business it is to know them. Hear what a douce and aged attorney says of your peculiarly promising barrister. Sharp? Oh yes, he's too sharp by half. He is not safe, not a minute, isn't that, young man? I extend this, and advisedly maintain, that nations, just as individuals, may be too clever to be practical, and not dull enough to be free. And what I call a proper stupidity keeps a man from all the defects of this character. It chains the gifted possessor mainly to his old ideas. It takes him seven weeks to comprehend an atom of a new one. It keeps him from being led away by new theories, for there is nothing which bores him so much. It restrains him within his old pursuits, his well-known habits, his tried expedients, his verified conclusions, his traditional beliefs. He is not tempted to levity or impatience, for he does not see the joke, and is thick-skinned to present evils. Inconsistency puts him out. What I says is this here, as I was a-saying yesterday, is his notion of historical eloquence and habitual discretion. He is very slow indeed to be excited. His passions, his feelings, and his affections are dull and tardy strong things, falling in a certain known direction fixed on certain known objects, and for the most part 
acting in a moderate degree and at a sluggish pace. You always know where to find his mind. Now, this is exactly what, in politics at least, you do not know about a Frenchman. Review Writing from the First Edinburgh Reviewers Review writing exemplifies the casual character of modern literature. Everything about it is temporary and fragmentary. Look at a railway stall. You see books of every colour, blue, yellow, crimson, ring-streaked, speckled and spotted. On every subject, in every style, of every opinion, with every conceivable difference, celestial or sublunary, maleficent, beneficent, but all small. People take their literature in morsels as they take sandwiches on a journey. And the change in appearance of books has been accompanied, has been caused, by a similar change in readers. What a transition from the student of former ages, from a grave man with grave cheeks and a considerate eye, who spends his life in study, has no interest in the outward world, hears nothing of its din and cares nothing for its honours, who would gladly learn and gladly teach, whose whole soul is taken up with a few books of Aristotle and his philosophy. To the merchant in the railway, with a head full of sums, an idea that tallow is up, a conviction that teas are lively, and a mind reverting perpetually from the little volume which he reads to these mundane topics, to the railway, to the shares, to the buying and bargaining universe. We must not wonder that the outside of books is so different when the inner nature of those for whom they are written is so changed. In this transition from ancient writing to modern, the review-like essay and the essay-like review fill a large space. Their small bulk, their slight pretension to systematic completeness, their avowal, it might be said, of necessary incompleteness, the facility of changing the subject, of selecting points to attack, of exposing only the best corner for defence, are great temptations. Still greater is the advantage of our limits. A real reviewer always spends his first and best pages on the parts of a subject on which he wishes to write, the easy comfortable parts which he knows. The formidable difficulties which he acknowledges, you foresee by a strange fatality, that he will only reach two pages before the end. To his great grief, there is no opportunity for discussing them. As a young gentleman at the India House examination wrote Time Up on nine unfinished papers in succession, so you may occasionally read a whole review, in every article of which the principal difficulty of each successive question is about to be reached at the conclusion. Nor can anyone deny that this is the suitable skill, the judicious custom of the craft. Lord Eldon, from the First Edinburgh Reviewers As for Lord Eldon, it is the most difficult thing in the world to believe that there ever was such a man. It only shows how intense historical evidence is that no one really doubts it. He believed in everything which it is impossible to believe in, in the danger of parliamentary reform, the danger of Catholic emancipation, the danger of altering the court of chancery, the danger of altering the courts of law, the danger of abolishing capital punishment for trivial thefts, the danger of making landowners pay their debts, the danger of making anything more, the danger of making anything less. It seems as if he maturely thought, now, I know the present state of things to be consistent with the existence of John Lord Eldon. But if we begin altering that state, I am sure I do not know that it will be consistent. As Sir Robert Walpole was against all committees of inquiry on the simple ground, if they once begin that sort of thing, who knows who will be safe? So that great Chancellor, still remembered in his own scene, looked pleasantly down from the woolsack and seemed to observe, well, it is a queer thing that I should be here, and here I mean to stay. Taste from Wordsworth, Tennyson and Browning There is a most formidable and estimable insane taste. 
the will has great though indirect power over the taste just as it has over the belief there are some horrid beliefs from which human nature revolts from which at first it shrinks to which at first no effort can force it but if we fix the mind upon them they have a power over us just because of their natural offensiveness they are like the sight of human blood experienced soldiers tell us that at first men are sickened by the smell and newness of blood almost to death and fainting but that as soon as they harden their hearts and stiffen their minds as soon as they will bear it then comes an appetite for slaughter a tendency to gloat on carnage to love blood at least for the moment with the deep eager love it is a principle that if we put down a healthy instinctive aversion nature avenges herself by creating an unhealthy insane attraction for this reason the most earnest truth-seeking men fall into the worst delusions they will not let their mind alone they force it towards some ugly thing which a crotchet of argument a conceit of intellect recommends and nature punishes their disregard of her warning by subjection to the ugly one by belief in it just so the most industrious critics get the most admiration they think it unjust to rest in their instinctive natural horror they overcome it and angry nature gives them over to ugly poems and marries them to detestable stanzas causes of the sterility of literature from shakespeare the man etc the reason why so few good books are written is that so few people that can write know anything in general an author has always lived in a room has read books has cultivated science is acquainted with the style and sentiments of the best authors but he is out of the way of employing his own eyes and ears he has nothing to hear and nothing to see his life is a vacuum the mental habits of robert southey which about a year ago were so extensively praised in the public journals are the type of literary existence just as the praise bestowed on them shows the admiration excited by them among literary people he wrote poetry as if anybody could before breakfast he read during breakfast he wrote history until dinner he corrected proof sheets between dinner and tea he wrote an essay for the quarterly afterwards and after supper by way of relaxation composed the doctor a lengthy and elaborate jest now what can anyone think of such a life except how clearly it shows that the habits best fitted for communicating information formed with the best care and daily regulated by the best motives are exactly the habits which are likely to afford a man the least information to communicate southey had no events no experiences his wife kept house and allowed him pocket money just as if he had been a german professor devoted to accents tobacco and the dates of horace's amours the critic in the vicar of wakefield lays down that you should always say that the picture would have been better if the painter had taken more pains but in the case of the practised literary man you should often enough say that the writings would have been much better if the writer had taken less pains he says he has devoted his life to the subject the reply is then you have taken the best way to prevent your making anything of it instead of reading studiously what burgers dicius and anasidimus said men were you should have gone out yourself and seen if you can see what they are but there is a whole class of minds which refer the literary delineation of objects to the actual eyesight of them such a man would naturally think literature more instructive than life hazlitt said of mackintosh he might like to read an account of india but india itself with its burning shining face would be a mere blank an endless waste to him persons of this class have no more to say to a matter of fact staring them in the face without a label in its mouth than they would to a hippopotamus after all the original way of writing books may turn out to be the best the first author it is plain 
could not have taken anything from books since there were no books for him to copy from he looked at things for himself anyhow the modern system fails for where are the amusing books from voracious students and habitual writers moreover in general it will perhaps be found that persons devoted to mere literature commonly become devoted to mere idleness they wish to produce a great work but they find they cannot having relinquished everything to devote themselves to this they conclude on trial that this is impossible they wish to write but nothing occurs to them therefore they write nothing and they do nothing as has been said they have nothing to do their life has no events unless they are very poor with any decent means of subsistence they have nothing to rouse them from an indolent and musing dream a merchant must meet his bills or he is civilly dead and uncivilly remembered but a student may know nothing of time and be too lazy to wind up his watch the search for happiness from william cowper if there be any truly painful fact about the world now tolerably well established by ample experience and ample records it is that an intellectual and indolent happiness is wholly denied to the children of men that most valuable author lucretius who has supplied us and others with an almost inexhaustible supply of metaphors on this topic ever dwells on the life of his gods with a sad and melancholy feeling that no such life was possible on a crude and cumbersome earth in general the two opposing agencies are marriage and lack of money either of these breaks the lot of literary and refined in action at once and forever the first of these as we have seen cowper had escaped his reserved and negligent reveries were still free at least from the invasion of affection to this invasion indeed there is commonly requisite the acquiescence or connivance of mortality but all men are born not free and equal as the americans maintain but in the old world at least basely subjected to the yoke of coin it is in vain that in this hemisphere we endeavour after impecuniary fancies in bold and eager youth we go out on our travels we visit balbeck and paphos and tadmor and cytheria ancient shrines and ancient empires seats of eager love or gentle inspiration we wander far and long we have nothing to do with our fellow men what are we indeed to diggers and counters we wander far we dream to wander forever but we dream in vain a surer force than the subtlest fascination of fancy is in operation the purse strings tie us to our kind our travel coin runs low and we must return away from tadmor and balbeck back to our steady tedious industry and dull work to la vie europe as napoleon said qui m'ennuie it is the same in thought in vain we seclude ourselves in elegant chambers in fascinating fancies in refined reflections on early reading from edward gibbon in schoolwork gibbon had uncommon difficulties and unusual deficiencies but these were much more than counterbalanced by a habit which often accompanies a sickly childhood and is the commencement of a studious life the habit of desultory reading the instructiveness of this is sometimes not comprehended s t coleridge used to say that he felt a great superiority over those who had not read and fondly read fairy tales in their childhood he thought they wanted a sense which he possessed the perception or apperception we do not know which he used to say it was of the unity and wholeness of the universe as to fairy tales this is a hard saying but as to desultory reading it is certainly true some people have known a time in life when there was no book they could not read the fact of its being a book went immensely in its favour in early life there is an opinion that the obvious thing to do with a horse is to ride it with a cake to eat it with sixpence to spend it 
a few boys carry this further, and think the natural thing to do with a book is to read it. There is an argument from design in the subject. If the book was not meant for that purpose, for what purpose was it meant? Of course, of any understanding of the work so perused, there is no question or idea. There is a legend of Bentham, in his earliest childhood, climbing to the height of a huge stool, and sitting there evening after evening with two candles, engaged in the perusal of Rapin's history. It might as well have been any other book. The doctrine of utility had not then dawned on its immortal teacher. Qui bono was an idea unknown to him. He would have been ready to read about Egypt, about Spain, about coals in Borneo, the teakwood in India, the current in the river Mississippi, on natural history or human history, on theology or morals, on the state of the Dark Ages or the state of the Light Ages, on Augustulus or Lord Chatham, on the first century or the seventeenth, on the moon, the millennium, or the whole duty of man. Just then, reading is an end in itself. At that time of life, you no more think of a future consequence, of the remote, the very remote possibility of deriving knowledge from the perusal of a book, than you expect so great a result from spinning a peg-top. You spin the top, and you read the book, and these scenes of life are exhausted. In such studies, of all prose, perhaps the best is history. One page is so like another. Battle number one is so much on a par with battle number two. Truth may be, as they say, stranger than fiction, abstractedly. But in actual books, novels are certainly odder and more astounding than correct history. It will be said, what is the use of this? Why not leave the reading of great books till a great age? Why plague and perplex childhood with complex facts, remote from its experience and inapprehensible by its imagination? The reply is that though in all great and combined facts there is much which childhood cannot thoroughly imagine, there is also, in very many, a great deal which can only be truly apprehended for the first time at that age. Youth has a principle of consolidation. We begin with the whole. Small sciences are the labours of our manhood, but the round universe is the plaything of the boy. His fresh mind shoots out vaguely and crudely into the infinite and eternal. Nothing is hid from the depth of it. There are no boundaries to its vague and wandering vision. Early science, it has been said, begins in utter nonsense. It would be truer to say that it starts with boyish fancies. How absurd seem the notions of the first Greeks. Who could believe now that air or water was the principle, the pervading substance, the eternal material of all things. Such affairs will never explain a thick rock, and what a white original for a green and sky-blue world. Yet people disputed in these ages not whether it was either of those substances, but which of them it was. And doubtless there was a great deal, at least in quantity, to be said on both sides. Boys are improved, but some in our own day have asked, Mamma, I say, what did God make the world of? And several, who did not venture on speech, have had an idea of some one grey primitive thing, felt a difficulty as to how the red came, and wondered that marble could ever have been the same as moonshine. This is in truth the picture of life. We begin with the infinite and eternal, which we shall never apprehend, and these form a framework, a schedule, a set of coordinates to which we refer all which we learn later. At first, like the old Greek, we look up to the whole sky and are lost in the one and the all. In the end we classify and enumerate, learn each star, calculate distances, draw cramped diagrams on the unbounded sky, write a paper on a signi and a treatise on the Idraconis map special facts upon the indefinite void, and engrave precise details on the infinite and everlasting. So, in history, somehow the whole comes in boyhood, the details later and in manhood. The wonderful series, 
going far back to the times of old patriarchs with their flocks and herds the keen-eyed greek the stately roman the watching jew the uncouth goth the horrid hun the settled picture of the unchanging east the restless shifting of the rapid west the rise of the cold and classical civilization its fall the rough impetuous middle ages the vague warm picture of ourselves and home when did we learn these not yesterday nor today but long ago in the first dawn of reason in the original flow of fancy what we learn afterwards are but the accurate littlenesses of the great topic the dates and tedious facts those who begin late learn only these but the happy first feel the mystic associations and the progress of the whole however exalted may seem the praises which we have given to loose and unplanned reading we are not saying that it is the sole ingredient of a good education besides this sort of education which some boys will voluntarily and naturally give themselves there needs of course another and more rigorous kind which must be impressed upon them from without the terrible difficulty of early life the use of pastors and masters really is that they compel boys to a distinct mastery of that which they do not wish to learn there is nothing to be said for a preceptor who is not dry mr carlyle describes with bitter satire the fate of one of his heroes who was obliged to acquire whole systems of information in which he the hero saw no use and which he kept as far as might be in a vacant corner of his mind and this is the very point dry language tedious mathematics a thumbed grammar a detested slate form gradually an interior separate intellect exact in its information rigid in its requirements disciplined in its exercises the two grow together the early natural fancy touching the far extremities of the universe lightly playing with the scheme of all things the precise compacted memory slowly accumulating special facts exact habits clear and painful conceptions at last as it were in a moment the cloud breaks up the division sweeps away we find that in fact these exercises which puzzled us these languages which we hated these details which we despised are the instruments of true thought are the very keys and openings the exclusive access to the knowledge which we loved the cavaliers from thomas babington macaulay what historian has ever estimated the cavalier character there is Clarendon, the grave, rhetorical, decorous lawyer, piling words, congealing arguments, very stately, a little grim. There is Hume, the Scotch metaphysician, who has made out the best case for such people as never were, for a Charles who never died, for a Strafford who would never have been attainted, a saving, calculating North Countryman, fat, impassive, who lived on eightpence a day what have these people to do with an enjoying english gentleman it is easy for a doctrinaire to bear a post-mortem examination it is much the same whether he be alive or dead but not so with those who live during their life whose essence is existence whose being is inanimation there seem to be some characters who are not made for history as there are some who are not made for old age a cavalier is always young. The buoyant life arises before us, rich in hope, strong in vigour, irregular in action. Men, young and ardent, framed in the prodigality of nature, open to every enjoyment, alive to every passion, eager, impulsive, brave without discipline, noble without principle, prizing luxury, despising danger capable of high sentiment but in each of whom the addiction was to courses vain his companies unlettered rude and shallow his hours filled up with riots banquets sports and never noted in him any study any retirement any sequestration from open haunts and popularity 
we see these men setting forth or assembling to defend their king or church and we see it without surprise a rich daring loves danger a deep excitability likes excitement if we look around us we may see what is analogous some say that the battle of the alma was won by the uneducated gentry the uneducated gentry would be cavaliers now the political sentiment is part of the character the essence of toryism is enjoyment talk of the ways of spreading a wholesome conservatism throughout this country give painful lectures distribute weary tracts and perhaps this as well you may be able to give an argumentative answer to a few objections you may diffuse a distinct notion of the dignified dullness of politics but as far as communicating and establishing your creed are concerned try a little pleasure the way to keep up old customs is to enjoy old customs the way to be satisfied with the present state of things is to enjoy that state of things over the cavalier mind this world passes with a thrill of delight there is an exaltation in a daily event zest in the regular thing joy at an old feast end of section thirty four recording by daniel fraser